Good evening and welcome to the virtual Marion Minor Cook Athenaeum. My name is Will Frankel and I'm one of your three Athenaeum fellows this year. We've all read the headlines from the New York Times. In Iowa Diner, Trump voters are unfazed by controversies. And from the National Post, faith in Donald Trump unshaken in heart of coal country. Because of that coverage, in the American psyche, the 2016 election is remembered as the election of the Youngstown Steel Mill or the Janesville Truck Stop. But if polling and trends since that election are to be trusted, next week might give us a different kind of election, that of the Scottsdale yoga class or the Madison frozen yogurt shop. Tonight's speaker will help explain why one of the candidates in next week's election is expected to overperform in the same suburbs that his opponent says he wants to destroy. Louis Geismer is an associate professor of history at Claremont McKenna College. Her research and teaching focuses on political and urban history in the United States. Her 2015 book, Don't Blame Us, Suburban Liberals and the Transformation of the Democratic Party, traces the reorientation of modern liberalism away from its roots in labor union halls to white collar professionals in post-industrial suburbs by focusing on the Route 128 corridor around Boston. Her next book, Doing Good, The Democrats in Neoliberalism from the War on Poverty to the Clinton Foundation, will explore the Democratic Party's promotion of market-based solutions to problems of social inequality. Her honors include fellowships from the Carnegie Foundation, the American Council of Learned Societies, and the Charles Warren Center, among many others. Professor Geismer will start with a presentation, and then we will ask some of our questions and some of yours. Using the written Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, we will be accepting questions throughout the program to be posed towards the end of the event. Preference will go to students, so when you send a question, please state your affiliation with the college. As always, I must remind you that audio and visual recording are strictly prohibited. And now, please join me in welcoming Professor Lily Geismer to the Athenaeum. Well, thank you so much, um, Will, for that introduction. And I should say that um, I had the, the pleasure of, of teaching Will in my first year honor seminar in American politics. Um, several years ago, and it's wonderful to see him as an Ask Fellow. Um, I'm so deeply honored to him and the other fellows, along with Priya, for the invitation to be part of the Falls, um, the Ask Fall virtual lineup. It's, um, it's always been um, a dream to speak at the Ask, um, but now I get to do it from the comfort of my home office. Um, so hopefully next time I, I, or if I ever get asked back again, I'll do it in the, in the actual Ask. But um, I'm also grateful to all of you. Um, in the audience um, who I, I can't see, but I imagine is filled with um, students, colleagues, and friends um, um, and family. Um, my, my parents had always wanted to see me give a talk at CMC and this, they, they're on the East Coast. And so this gave them a chance to do that. I'm also aware that I'm up against a big World Series game. So the fact that um, you are participating is a, is a particularly big um, big honor and, and shows the kind of the fascination with um, this topic of um, suburban politics. So I will, um, with that, I will sort of start talking about it. Um, for anyone who follows, who's been following Trump's re-election campaign, um, you might have noticed an increasing effort to target suburban voters. Over the summer, Trump made several statements and tweets um, that specifically focused on a policy enacted under the Obama administration, um, which was an effort to um, reduce economic and racial segregation of the suburbs um, called Affirmatively Furthering Fair Housing, or um, AFFH. You can see that in, the, um, in some of the tweets. Um, in Trump's estimation, this policy, along with efforts to defund the police, um, would destroy the beautiful suburbs. Um, he made several statements to that effect. He also discussed that, um, that he himself um, would, quote, protect the suburban lifestyle dream. Um, and to me, that sounds, it sort of sounds like the, um, an indie pop band's concept album. So the, the, but he's going to protect the, the sort of lifestyle dream. Um, there's a lot of discussions of the sort of suburbs become, if, if, if he doesn't win, becoming overrun. Trump's um, tweets all have focused specifically um, on, the, on suburban women. Um, and there's a, a series of tweets, which I'll show now, um, specifically targeting subur um, the suburban women. So the first, um, the first statement here, um, one of them was that, that this, this idea that um, the suburban housewife will be voting for me. They want safety. And I'm thrilled that I ended a long, I ended a long um, running program where low income housing would invade their neighborhood. Biden would reinstall it in a bigger form um, with Cory Booker in charge. 
Um, I'll save the Cory Booker part if anyone has any questions about that for the Q&A. But um, he then, as it turned out that suburban women didn't seem to be um, saying that they were gonna vote for him, um, getting increasingly desperate. And a couple of weeks ago, at a rally, um, he declared, um, can you, um, can I ask you a favor, suburban women? Will you please um, like me? Please, please, I saved your damn neighborhood. Okay. So as these statements suggest, the suburbs, especially suburban women, are, um, are under siege from Democrats and Trump is the last line of defense from their utter destruction. This has been a, this vision has been a surprise to many suburban voters as it does not reflect their reality. First and foremost, establishing what is a suburb is hard. There is no one definition. As a spoiler alert for any of you interested in taking my course on the history of American suburbia, we spend the first couple of periods talking about this. Here's the official definition from the dictionary. You can see it's quite broad, um, the user, usual residential region around a major city. The Census Bureau's definition is, some, is equally broad, um, which is a municipality of more than um, 2,500 people located within a metropolitan area, but not including the area's main city. Um, scholars have long debated the proper mechanisms of how to determine what makes a space uh, or a person suburban. And they've used a series of overlapping and competing measures like geography, the built environment, density, transportation networks, racial and economic characteristics, familial arrangements, cultural sensibility, ideology, and politics. And the term really, um, in many ways, has become used more culturally and politically as a kind of shorthand to mean middle and upper, upper middle class, white and often college educated people. Um, and this seems to be the suburban voter that Trump is evoking. And it brings back kind of images of the 1950s sitcoms like Leave it to Beaver, um, this, the famous um, single family homes of Levittown, which I showed here, which are filled with um, homogeneous heterosexual white middle class couples with traditional gender roles. But this is actually the exception rather than the norm in most of the, na of the um, nation's largest metropolitan regions. Um, today, in most, in most large uh, metropolitan regions, um, more um, non-white and poor residents live in the suburbs than the city. This, the suburbs in the last 20 years have seen a particularly sharp rise in African-American re um, residents and also first-generation immigrant groups, um, especially as many um, immigrants have bypassed central cities and moved into, um, moved into the, the suburbs. And the latest data, most of the data is from um, the 2010 census. So I imagine these will sort of will even intensify more once we have the information of the 2020 census, um, although that's gonna be problematic in its own right. Um, Equally striking, um, there are roughly 3 million more um, poor people in suburbs than in cities. Um, and that's a number that's, that's pre-pandemic. So I imagine that that, that will only, that will intensify, um, has intensified since, um, since 2018. Um, more than 60% of adult residents um, do not have a college degree. And I couldn't find the exact statistics, but the number of traditional nuclear families in, are decreasing. Um, more and more families have dual, um, dual earner incomes, both by choice and by the economic reality. Um, there are many more um, same-sex couples, divorced families, um, single parents. So family arrangements are looking um, very, very different. And this is this, these numbers are by no means should we think of the suburbs as kind of these as suddenly as diverse utopias. Um, sub, suburban areas are, are in many ways more segregated and stratified by race and income than ever. For instance, in a place like Orange County near, um, near Claremont, you, you have wealthy all white suburbs um, abutting um, communities of low income immigrant residents and there's little overlap or mixing. Um, this also means that there's no real singular suburban voter. Um, Trump, however, is not entirely wrong to understand the importance of white suburban women in, in the 2020 election. In 2016, Trump won the overall suburban vote by 2%, um, and he did especially well in white working class um, and middle class suburbs. This is the so-called sort of blue wall of, um, of um, Wisconsin, Michigan, Ohio, and Pennsylvania. Um, this time around, um, as Will mentioned, the polls have Biden up substantially um, in the suburbs. Um, and the, the numbers have, it looks at that while, while white suburban men overall have actually been, are, are supporting Trump um, over Biden um, and non-white voters of both, of both genders are supporting um, Biden overwhelmingly, um, actually suburban women 
are supporting Biden over um, over Trump. Um, and this um, this sort of get this this is looking like it can kind of swing the suburbs um, much, much more towards towards Biden. So that's these are the kind of numbers and that what what Trump is working with. Um, I imagine you asking yourself at this point, um, why does everyone care so much about these white middle class suburbanites um, when they're not even um, the majority of people living in the suburbs? Um, but there is a few really important, there are a few important reasons. First and foremost, this is a group that holds a great deal of um, social and political capital, um, which is in part why the media has covered them so extensively. They've often been the kind of centerpiece of media stories and the, this is why kind of it, that's intensified um, in the 2020 election. Um, second, second, white suburbanites tend to vote in large numbers. And they've traditionally been one of the few swing voters. And as the, um, as the electorate has become increasingly polarized and elections have actually been quite close, it, when swing voters become the kind of major focus of presidential campaigns. And because of that, they've, had, they've held this kind of, this really important place within American politics. Trump's efforts to win them back has, is, relies on a longstanding strategy Republicans have used. Um, so this kind of suburb, this, this uh, suburban strategy um, that was adopted most prominently by Richard Nixon in 1968. So 1968 is perhaps one of the years that rivals 2020 in terms of social and political tumult. Um, and the combination events made Americans very fearful about the future of the nation. Nixon um, made an appeal explicitly to white middle-class um, voters in the suburbs, the so-called silent majority, who were concerned about urban protests um, and uprisings, the demand for residential um, and school integration. Um, and he, he based this around this, this kind of this idea of law and order. Um, his campaign ads used chaos in the streets and a focus on law and uh, focus on restoring order that are, um, if you look at um, some of the campaigns the Republican National Committee has been running, there's, a, there's, a, there's clear parallels here. Um, and I included some of the quotations that he used in his effort to kind of appeal to suburban voters um, from his nomination acceptance address in 1968. Um, and you can see here that there's, there's a, a very explicitly kind of race neutral tone. Um, and he takes on actually in, in the speech, he took on head on the claims that law and order was, a, was, was racist. Um, and he said, it's not a code word for racist. It's about respecting the law. This proved to be a really effective strategy and, um, and Nixon narrowly, um, narrowly won uh, the 1968 election largely from this kind of support of suburban residents across the country. And this tech tactic has been adopted um, by Republican candidates um, from 1960, the 1968 onwards. Nixon used it again, Reagan used it, um, George W. Bush used it. Um, and I think one of the things of, um, that's important to sort of think about is what one of the things that Trump is doing is making kind of explicit something that other candidates have done more implicitly in their efforts to appeal to white, to white middle class um, voters. The part of Trump's comments that I find particularly striking um, is the idea that Democrats are trying to destroy the suburbs especially since I've spent a great time looking at how the Democrats have done just the opposite. My academic research has looked at how the Democrats have developed their own suburban strategy that's focused primarily on white um, affluent suburban professionals. And that's what, I'll, uh, that's what I plan to sort of talk more about today. My first book came out in, um, which came out in 2015, is called Don't Blame Us, Suburban Liberals and the Transformation of the Democratic Party. Um, I always say you can't judge a book by its cover, but I, I really like the cover of the book. So I put it up here for you all to see. The title comes from a bumper sticker um, that circulated in Massachusetts um, after it was the only state George McGovern won in the 1972 election. And the bumper sticker declared, don't blame me, I'm from Massachusetts. The book counters that conventional narrative of kind of Massachusetts exceptionalism and liberal decline that's in that, that it was embedded in that, that bumper sticker um, and shows how they have obscured the growing centrality of high-tech growth and suburban professionals in shaping the, the state and the nation's political priorities. Specifically, I looked at the, the activities and priorities of professionals um, who lived along the Route 128 corridor outside of Boston. Um, and this is kind of like the Silicon um, Valley of Boston to show not the demise, but reorientation and transformation of modern liberalism and the Democratic Party, um, not just in New England, but nationally, away from ur urban ethnics and labor unions to suburban knowledge workers um, and, and high-tech corporations. And I contend that this shift has contributed to both the persistence of liberalism in the Democratic Party 
and intensified racial and structural inequality across the United States. I showed that the Democratic Party's efforts to cater to the financial interests and social values of affluent white suburban families and high tech corporations meant that they made the priorities of unions and the economic needs of middle income and poor, um, poor residents of all races um, ever less a priority. The New Deal itself spawned many of these transformations. And that's, that's particularly sort of, sort of this question of the, the Democrats trying to destroy the suburbs because in many ways, it's, um, it's Democrats under the New Deal that construct help, that, that played a huge role in constructing um, mass suburbia after, in, after World War II. As part of the effort, if that's to, efforts to create economic security and opportunity and stabilize market forces, New Deal and post-war bureaucrats developed a vast range of public policies from mortgage initiatives, tax incentives, consumer credit, subsidies for home building to road construction and urban disinvestment, that it all encouraged single family home ownership for whites outside of central cities. If you take, again, if you take the suburbia class, you can get a lot of that, this information too. In addition, um, World War II and then the Cold War led the federal government to significantly increase the funding of defense and scientific um, research at universities. And Boston's Harvard and especially MIT led the way um, in getting this funding. And it led to innovation at, at a variety of different labs. And many of the researchers decided to turn their ideas into private technology and electronics companies. Um, this, th many of these companies moved um, to um, research parks that were constructed along this new highway that was built of Route 128. And at the t in the 1950s and, and 60s, Route 28 was actually the biggest and fast fastest growing um, tech area in the country. Um, while well, some of the academics and employees of these companies opted to try reside in Cambridge um, or gentrifying Boston neighborhoods, many more, especially with families with small children, chose to move to the affluent suburbs clustered along the roadway, um, especially the towns of Concord, um, Lexington, Lincoln, Newton, and Brookline, which are the kind of the focus of which I looked at extensively in my research. And there's a map of those along this along the um, along the, the highway. Um, and for those of you who haven't been to these places, I included some pictures to sort of evoke the idea. I also thought that given it's um, virtual, it's always summer in California, we could have some fall, fall like feel um, from the from from these New England pictures. Um, the these were very sort of beautiful communities and the aesthetics and amenities resulted came from very deliberate zoning practices. In the post war period in response to the growth of the highway and the rise of mass suburbanization, most of these towns adopted a one or two acre minimum zone um, zoning policy, which meant that you had, that was the, the, the minimum size a lot could be was one, was one or two acres. Um, they also had rules requiring the construction of, sing, that you could only construct single family homes um, and very strict historic preservation rules. These measures ensured that the communities were very attractive and did not look like the, the typical sort of post-war suburb of kind of, of sort of mass produced housing. Um, but it also meant that they were very exclusive um, since they prevented anyone who could not afford to buy a single family home on a large lot of land um, to, to live there and thus contributed, contributed to, to racial and economic segregation in the Boston area. These actions also kept the tax rate down and enabled the town, these towns to produce better, better municipal services at lower rates. This was especially important in the case of education and all of these suburban communities that I looked at um, had reputations as some of the best public schools in the country, which was another key motivating factor in encouraging a certain type of resident to, to move there. So this clustering of, of like-minded people um, in these particular communities served as a, as a catalyst for grassroots mobilization on a, lar on a wide range of issues of, um, uh, that were sort of social and political issues, um, ranging from fair housing, school integration, peace, um, environmentalism, and feminism, and opposition to my, the Vietnam War. And I looked in my, in my book at, the, at these various different kinds, of, um, these different kinds of organizing. And what I found was that suburban liberals were the most supportive of campaigns that proposed individualist solutions to rights-related issues, required limited financial sacrifice, and offered tangible quality of life issues. Any issue that, that, that threatened entitlements of home ownership, especially property values, tax rates, or their children's education, um, met much greater resistance and had far less success. So to put this bluntly, residents tended to be most supportive of issues that were least threatening and furthest away from their property values, their tax rates, and their children's education. Most suburbanites, even self-described liberal ones, understood their decisions about where to live as individual choices and rights, 
rather than the product of interventions by the federal government. And thus they were, they had, they were and, and, and have continued to be less likely to see how they benefited from state subsidies that perpetuated forms of racial and, and um, economic inequality. My book looked at this in a variety of different ways, um, but I thought to show these dynamics, I would focus on the issues of fair and affordable housing since that's been so central to Trump's, um, Trump's campaign efforts. The issue of combating residential discrimination called fair housing um, was the first major issue to galvanize Route 128 residents um, in the late 1950s and early 1960s. And many residents were shocked um, when they found out they'd moved to the suburbs and then they were shocked to find out um, that African-Americans faced, um, faced difficulty finding housing in the same suburbs. Um, this concern fueled a, mu a movement which quickly spread across the, um, the Boston suburbs. And I would say this is also a national, um, a national movement um, in suburban communities across the country, but Boston was kind of the pace setter of this, of it. Um, and the local, the, it, these local committees, um, aim to help individual African-American families gain access to, to local real estate markets using tactics. Um, one of the tactics they pioneered was racial testing, where an African-American would try to rent or buy a house, um, and then a, a realtor would say no, and then a white family would go, uh, some of the white suburbanites would go in and, and, and they would get it, and then they would accuse the realtor of discrimination. That's a, it's a still a tactic that um, fair housing activists use today. They also staged protests, and here's a protest staged at the um, at the Lexington Battle Green in, um, in in a case of a discrimination against a foreign officer. This image highlights the role of um, women as key players in the movement. There were many, um, and oftentimes, who brought their their small children to the um, to protests. The um, housewives, like the women featured here, also organized a door to door signature campaign in their towns um, called Good Neighbors for fair housing, which asked their local, their local residents to pledge not to discriminate. This is a poster produced by the Brookline Group, and I think it embodies a lot of the movement's ideology and goals. So you see these two smiling families, um, and which shows this kind of ideal um, that everyone is the same on the inside. Um, yet it also has clear ideas about the traditional nuclear family. And it also shows the really narrow and class specific ways that members understood the very broad idea of fair housing. These groups frequently adopted expansive terms and ideas like equal opportunity and freedom of choice, but interpreted that to mean that everyone who could afford to do so had the right to live in the suburbs. In addition, the community's most open to residential discrimination, or sorry, residential integration, um, and with the most active fair housing committees like, like Lexington, Brookline, um, and uh, Newton and Concord, also had some of the area's most um, expensive housing stock. The number of African-Americans who wanted to, to move into suburban areas and could afford to do so actually represented a very small percentage of Boston's black population. And the beneficiaries of the community strategies were, were almost exclusively white collar professionals and academics. These values became replicated in the political system as well. And, and one thing that I found in my, re my research is that suburban um, political activists were very effective at mobile, of working through the political system. Um, and they did so to pass fair housing, in the case of fair housing, very stronger fair housing laws. Um, through their lobbying, um, they were able to get um, Massachusetts to pass the most progressive fair housing law in the nation by 1963. Yet the law only addressed discrimination um, in rental and sales, and it did not tackle the issue of exclusionary zoning. Um, and thus offered very little assistance to the majority of African Americans who could not afford housing outside of segregated neighborhoods. So these laws have become very symbolically significant. Um, and it the help to kind of reinforce this idea that everyone had the opportunity to overcome the structures of segregation, but the um, but it also concealed the root causes of segregation, um, which had much ha which would have long term consequences. And I think what you can see is the real limits of this suburban liberal vision predicated on individual solutions and middle class pr privilege becomes clearest on the issue of affordable housing and trying to tackle um, exclusionary zoning. And so what is known as kind of trying to open up the suburbs. Um, this occurs in the late 1960s um, and was part of a national effort. Um, in the winter of 1968, the National um, Advisory Commission on Civil Disorders, which is better known as the Kerner Commission, released a famous report responding to the urban uprisings of the 1960s, especially the ones that the, the very large ones that had happened in Detroit and Newark. 
And it made this really powerful conclusion of that to continue with our present policies is to, is to make permanent the division in our country into two societies, um, one, one, what basically one poor and black in central cities and one predominantly white and affluent um, located in the suburbs. Um, this sparked um, this conclusion about the kind of racial and spatial divisions in the United States sparked a discussion about the need to increase housing opportunities for people of color and the poor outside of central cities. The, um, the Housing and Urban Development Act, which was passed in 1968, um, called on the federal government to, to increase and diversify suburbs. And in, when, Mitt Rom when George Romney, who's Mitt's, Mitt Romney's father, became secretary of HUD in 1969, he built on the discussion and made reducing the barriers of suburban exclusion a top priority. Romney developed a plan called Open Communities to use HUD funding to entice or coerce suburbs into revoking their exclusionary zoning laws. And it would deny all grants administered by HUD, including things like for sewer and water projects, um, open space acquisition and urban renewal to suburbs if they did not accept, um, if they did not accept subsidized low-income housing. And at the outset of the 70s, there was a real sense that this was the, that this issue of opening the suburbs would be the major kind of political. Um, battle of the decade ahead. You can see this Newsweek put it on the suburb, the cover of the Battle of the Suburbs, um, and this was going to kind of address things. Um, the Kerner Commission's warnings, compounded by the King assassination in April 1968, in the Route 128 area, um, spawned local residents to want to address many of the sort of lib liberal residents to um, address the problems of racial and economic segregation um, and try to build their own affordable housing developments. And in the suburb of Newton, a local interfaith organization um, attempted to build a, a project that would have been 500 uh, mixed income and gov government subsidized units um, scattered across 10 sites around the suburb. And I should say, um, Newton has a population of, of about um, 80,000, um, so 500 units to, to about um, 80,000 people. Um, this created a really fierce battle. Um, and I would say opponents rarely used overtly racist language or even sort of racialized language, or it was racialized, um, when they, when, why they opposed having affordable housing in their communities. Um, instead, they focused on the local tax rate, their own prop property values and the fear that this would overrun the schools if you had lots more children coming in. Um, the battle stretched, stretched on for, for almost nine years, um, playing itself out in, um, in, within town meetings and various different other forums. And it ultimately led, um, led the plans to be reduced to a single project. Um, and this, these, these have become sort of classic examples of what's known as NIMBYism or not in my backyard. Another case of NIMBYism occurred in Concord um, over a single piece of property. And the residents who lived on that site fought it on environmental grounds, cont contending that the site selected was on, a, um, was on a wetland. And that battle dragged on um, for, I think it's like close to seven years um, in town meetings and eventually the state courts between thwarted. Ultimately, what, what happened is all these sort of suburban, and there's multiple other examples amongst the Boston suburbs. Um, I just selected two of them. Many of the communities circumvented um, calls to build affordable housing um, by building a few units in that were intended for um, elderly white residents. And that did very little to address the larger problems of racial and economic diversity in the Route 128 area. This parallels things that were happening in national politics. Very similar battles occurred in Westchester County um, and the Bay Area. At the same time, Richard Nixon in the early 1970s um, directly countered the efforts of his own of his own um, head of HUD, um, George Romney, um, basically forcing Romney to abandon the open communities um, a, a open communities program and eventually resign. Um, and instead, he, um, Nixon explicitly endorsed um, local control over land use um, and advocated for a very limited role for the for the federal government to step in. Um, he instead encouraged um, suburban communities to buy and to, in, to provide fair housing on a voluntary basis. So if you if that's something that you, that should be your choice in a suburban community if you want to do that, but it, it shouldn't be uh, shouldn't be forced. Um, a couple of years later, Nixon went even further and announced a moratorium on the production of all federally funded housing projects. And this had a chilling effect on the construction of public housing, not just in the suburbs, but um, but but in in all areas um, that has perpetuated to this day. The Supreme Court eventually followed suit, um, and in, 19, in the 1975 case, um, ruled that all. And this was to address the, the specific issue of exclusionary zoning. Um, they they 
they ruled that although exclusionary zoning policies um, intentionally excluded low and moderate income people, it was the consequences of, of, the, of the economics of the area's housing market. So this is sort of about the freedom of the market. I should also say the Supreme Court has ruled in the 1970s on these cases to try to, try to ad address um, economic seg and segregation and stratification that um, that class is not a that the economic class is not a suspect um, class and does not deserve heightened protection. So that has made it really hard to challenge these kinds of these kinds of issues um, within the courts. The combination of these rulings and the fierce opposition of the suburbs contributed to pushing the issues of affordable housing and exclusionary zoning out of the political conversation um, for multiple generations. Um, it's not been on the platform of, of, um, of major political parties um, and even housing more broadly has not really been an issue until the, tw the 2020 Democratic primary. Um, it was a, it's been one of the first times you see sort of discussions of housing actually coming, coming up. It's worth noting that despite all of Trump's comments um, about Obama's efforts to build affordable housing in the suburbs, Obama did not make um, did not make that an, a major campaign issue in either 2008 or, or 2008 or 2012, and the policy in question, affirmatively furthering fair housing, um, which is it's quite a tongue twister, was relatively technical, um, and HUD didn't announce it until well into Obama's um, second term, and to not a lot of fanfare. I mean, I think it's one of those things that was fall that. that was a big deal among sort of housing policy wonks, but there was no kind of big rose garden rollout for this one. It's worth noting and not a contradiction that at the very same time, these affluent suburban um, residents were actively resisting affordable housing. Their support for the Democratic Party in national elections intensified. Despite the fact that George McGovern that lost, um, in overwhelmingly lost in the 1972 election, it represented that that election represented the first time a, a Democratic presidential candidate did better with white collar um, than blue collar voters. And McGovern made considerable gains in affluent suburbs throughout the country with his platform. Um, as I show in my book, he, he, suburban professionals were actually really key to his winning of the state of Massachusetts, that sort of flukish one, one state. Um, and the campaign, therefore, was, was not the failure that it's often depicted to be, but actually a precursor of the types of platforms Democratic candidates would increasingly come to run on. In su subsequent years, Democratic politicians refined more McGovern's strategy. Um, leading the pack was a group of Democratic politicians um, that known at, um, which included people like um, California Governor Jerry Brown, this was the first time he was governor, um, Colorado Senators Gary Hart and Tim Worth, and Massachusetts um, Governor Mike Dukakis. These politicians all came from suburban districts, um, and they they had a they had they had a strong white suburban base with a, a platform that combined liberal stances on foreign policy, civil rights, feminism, and the environment with a commitment to stimulating entrepreneurship and private sector growth, particularly in the high tech industry. And that eventually in the early 1980s earned them the great, um, the great name, the Atari Democrats, which for those of you who don't know, Atari was a, a popular video game um, in the, um, in the 19, um, early 1980s. Tim Worth said that they, he preferred to be called um, the Apple Democrats because that sounded more American since Atari was a, a Japanese company. Um, but the focus on expanding high tech the high tech sector and keeping taxes low made the Atari Democrats especially popular among suburban voters. In 1988, Dukakis rode this wave of high tech growth that he helped foster in Massachusetts, which came to be known as the Massachusetts miracle, um, to the Democratic presidential nomination. And he coupled these promises of high tech growth um, based on the Route 128 model with a concern of quality life issues like traffic, air pollution, sprawl, and rising in crime drug problems. Um, he himself was from the suburb of Brookline. Um, he'd grown up there and he lived there and he made this kind of idea of being a suburban resident part of his identity. Um, this is one of my favorite images, but this is him cutting his own, um, his, the hedge of his, uh, at his house in July of 1988, the height of the presidential, um, the presidential election. Um, he lost, um, I don't think it was because he was out doing a lot of yard work, um, but one of the big factors was, um, was the infamous um, Willie Horton ad. Um, and, but he did, um, he did earn a following among white collar professionals in the metropolitan areas, um, especially of the, of the Sun Belt, the West and the Northeast. And four years later, Bill Clinton and the Democratic Leadership Council refined his strategy even more explicitly targeting moderate suburban swing voters. 
adhering to the maxim sprawl is where the voters are, Clinton successfully reached out to white collar moderates. Um, and these voters were at the, the center of Clinton's famed soccer mom strategy in 1996. Um, that was who was the sort of archetypal, archetypal swing voter of the 1996 election was this, this the, the capturing the kind of suburban, um, the suburban so white so suburban soccer mom. Clinton won 53% of suburban women and kept the White House. And this reinforced the place of affluent suburban voters at the heart of the Democratic Party's political strategy. Um, and led to kind of a set of messages and policy agenda to match. Al Gore also used these ideas of kind of promoting a, what, a livability agenda in 2000, promising to address traffic congestion, create more open space and public parks in affluent suburbia as an effort to win suburban voters. Um, and he, um, he also did quite well. The suburbs were quite evenly divided amongst, um, amongst Bush and, and Gore, and uh, I guess as, as was everything in 2000. Um, Obama took a very similar approach in 2008. He swore to transcend the red-blue divide and invest in our middle class, and he won more suburban votes than, um, than John McCain um, and captured really key battleground states like Virginia and Colorado, which, which had a high concentration of upper middle class knowledge workers, like the kinds of people who live on Route 128. And while I mentioned that Trump narrowly won voters who lived in the suburbs over Hillary Clinton, um, Trump's success was largely with working class and, and, and more solidly um, lower middle class suburbs around the country. Um, Hillary Clinton um, won white college educated voters 55% um, to Trump's 38%. Um, and she actually improved on Obama's 2012 performance in 48 of the country's 50 most well-educated su um, suburbs considerably. And, and Obama had done quite well there too. Um, and so I think what, one of the things this shows is why it's dangerous to talk about a singular suburban vote, but it also shows that one of the kind of important dividing lines um, in the suburbs and nationally has is, is been education. And that's been one of the kind of, one of the lessons um, of the 2016 election. Um, Following 2016 and learning from these, these, um, these polls, the Democrats have largely continued this strategy by trying to make gains in, sub in moderate suburban districts, especially amongst white, all educa white college educated suburban women, um, some of whom might have voted for Trump but have grown increasingly alienated. As one strategist predicted in 2017, the Democrats' path forward runs through the Panera breads of America. So I had to put a picture of um, a group of Hillary Clinton supporters at a Panera Bread somewhere, but there they are. Um, this became the strategy um, in the 20, the Democrat strategy in the 2018 midterms, which was known as the red to blue strategy, was deliberately targeted red districts with large numbers of suburban voters. And it has led to what pundits have called the suburban revolt. This strategy worked um, of the 41 seats Democrats picked up in the 2018 election, 38 um, we're in predominantly suburban dis in the districts. And I think one of the things that's worth noting is that there's been a lot of attention to the, the so-called squad um, who are uh, as kind of freshman Democratic um, representatives. But a lot of the representatives who came in were, were, were people like Nikki Sherrill um, in, um, in New Jersey, who comes from a kind of suburban district and, 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 um, and ran a very kind of uh, platform that appealed to the kinds of voters, the, the sort of predominantly white voters who live in her district. Another and slightly different suburban revolt has also been going on since 2016. Um, as Trump's election has really galvanized liberal leaning but pre previously politically inactive women in suburban areas. Um, these are the so-called resistance moms. Um, they have come out in full force in response to the killing of George Floyd. Um, and um, the widespread, there's been this kind of notable um, appearance of Black Lives Matter in suburban subdivisions across the country, which has been interpreted as a sea change of, um, of, of suburban attitudes. Uh, it's been coupled with the kind of mainstream use of terms like structural racism and acknowledgement amongst many suburbanites of the longer history of federal housing policy and fueling segregation. So it could be that all of Trump's rhetoric um, around affordable housing um, actually turns many suburban voters to support it. Um, that many, it's an issue that many people are not always aware of, um, but that Trump has made, has made it such that, he, that it'll actually make people more supportive of it um, and, and work to sort of change their local zoning code. 
Um, several cities have already been eliminating single family zoning to combat the chronic, chronic lack of affordable housing. Minneapolis is one example, has been working on this for a long time. Um, but I'm still somewhat skeptical um, what that certain types of reforms are possible without pressure from the federal government or a fully mobilized um, grassroots movement. Um, if the experiences of the suburban liberals I study here is a guide, it's one thing to sort of read white fragility and put up a yard sign. It's another to actively and affirmatively work to change your local zoning code to make it more inclusionary. Um, it's another thing to, in the abstract, say you would support the construction of affordable housing, but it's quite another when there are plans to put a building next to your house, um, which is was one of the things that was clear in a lot of the communities that I studied in the 1960s and 1970s. Similarly, it's one thing to say you oppose, you're opposed to excessive police violence towards African Americans and racial bias in the criminal justice system, and another to, to support efforts to reduce the police budget of your local community. For his part, Biden's approach um, to suburban voters has been largely reactive to things that Trump has said. Um, in the chaotic first debate, um, you, some of you might have missed this because there was so much going on, but there actually was a section on the suburbs. Um, and um, Biden declared our suburbs would be gone under a Biden, or sorry, Trump declared our suburbs would be gone under a Biden presidency. And Biden responded that he wouldn't know a suburb and took in, in, um, unless he took a wrong turn. I was raised in the suburbs. This is not 1950. Um, all these dog whistles and racism won't work anymore. Suburbs are, um, are by and large integrated. Yet, as probably clear from the talk, um, this is kind of equally a, a kind of fantastical vision um, of, of suburb suburbs. Um, since suburbs are segregated by race and um, more segregated by race and class than ever, with wealthy suburbs like the ones I study, um, the most economically and racially homogenous and insulated. Um, however, I would imagine that Biden recognized that this type of of statement would be very appealing to the types of suburban voters who have been swinging over to him, who are tired of Trump's explicitly racist and divisive statements. Um, it signals that Biden himself is not a racist. Um, in addition, Biden said, has said that he does not believe in defunding the police, abolishing ICE, or creating universal health care, all of which are things that have proven less than popular amongst moderate um, white suburban voters. But it's also worth remembering the dynamics of the last five years. Um, and I know the Democratic primary seems like a long time away, oh, go, oh so long ago, but, but um, it's important to remember that the Bernie Sanders campaigns of, in 2016 and 2020 demonstrated that there's a range of people who've been really frustrated with the Democratic Party's longstanding efforts to cater to soccer moms and knowledge workers in affluent suburbs, as well as Wall Street corporations and Silicon Valley tech companies. Many people across the political, um, economic, ra racial, and racial spectrum have been questioning the ability of the party's mainstream establishment to address their concerns. While defeating Trump has appeared to unify the disparate parts of the Democratic Party while bringing in su suburban new supporters, maintaining a strategy that focuses on Panera Bread and the, the mythic white woman who eats there will make it very challenging for the Democrats to create a long-term stable majority or the most progressive agenda since the New Deal as Biden has claimed he will offer. Thus, before everyone gets really celebratory about the Democrats winning of the suburban vote, it's worth considering that there is no indication that this is a permanent realignment. More importantly, and as I've argued repeatedly and tried to show today, there are really important policy trade-offs in the Democrats' efforts to secure the support of white middle-class affluent suburbanites. In his comments about the suburbs in the first debate, Biden did go on to suggest that what is, a, what is really a threat to the suburbs and their safety is Trump's failure to deal with COVID. They're dying in the suburbs, his failure to deal with the environment. They're being flooded, they're being burned out um, because of his refusal to do anything. I would recommend that if the Democrats want to create a stable majority and build a truly progressive platform, they might build a strategy on this comment rather than the one on the previous slide. This would mean thinking of the average suburbanite as a Latina immigrant who, got, who just got laid off from Panera rather than, the, than just the people who eat there. It also means thinking about the African-American residents outside Atlanta, deeply concerned about COVID and criminal justice, blue collar voters in the upper Midwest worried about free trade and residents in places like Irvine who are under the threat of wildfires in parts spurred by climate change. 
This more inclusive vision could, could lead to the development of not just short-term electoral strategies, but actual policies that improve the quality of life of suburban residents, not just in the Route 128 area, but places like Ferguson and the Inland Empire. As we deal with the long-term health and economic consequences of the pandemic, which in particular will make the issue and the need of, 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 for affordable housing more pressing than ever, it's, it's, more, it's ever more important to take an ex expansive and inclusive view of the suburbs, not just for electoral strategies of the Democratic Party, but for addressing the issues of racial and economic inequality too. So thank you so much um, for listening and I'm, um, I'm glad to take any and all questions that you have. Thank you um, for that great talk. Um, so the first question I wanted to ask you was about um, basically the difference between um, suburbanites in uh, red states and blue states. So like the Boston suburbs are liberal leaning intrinsically. Uh, so how have suburban politics and um, commensurate housing policy evolved in red states? Um, and what are the similarities and differences? Um, I mean, does it play out? Well, I mean, I think one of the things is that we often, we often use these kind of red state, blue state binaries to think about, um, to think about places, but it's important to remember that they're, that they're liberal, they're, they're conservative leaning people in Boston, just as there are, um, that just as there are liberal people who live in, um, in traditionally red, um, in red states. Um, I will say, um, I mean, I think that the kind of grassroots movements to build affordable housing come has happened more in kind of traditionally liberal places. Um, many of the other in, in traditionally conservative places that have often more actively fought um, um, forms of integration, those have actually come much more by federal mandate. Um, and you can see this actually more clearly um, in the case of, um, of education, where it's actually um, because of the the because of the involvement of the federal courts and in, um, in manda making desegregation mandatory, um, the places in the South actually have more. To, and, and when it was under when especially when they were under um, they were under um, consent decrees, had much more integrated how schools than um, than more traditionally liberal places in the North. Um, so that's one place where you can kind of see these kinds of differences play themselves out. Thanks. Uh, I wanted to ask a question that's going to take a second for me to set up. Uh, the research that you're presenting describes the Democrats' effort to appeal to these suburban voters as being a move to the ideological middle. Um, but in the context, at least, of California's housing crisis, it seems like the politicians who've embraced anti-suburban policies, uh, like, for example, ending single-family zoning, in part at least by reducing community control over land use decisions, uh, are often actually coded as moderates and uh, corporate Democrats, kind of like the Atari Democrats you described. Uh, California State Senator Scott Weiner, uh, San Francisco's Mayor London Breed both come to mind. Uh, while on the other hand, uh, Senator Bernie Sanders, clearly running as the candidate of the left in the 2016 primary, pretty openly on a few occasions stated his opposition to upzoning and development of certain areas with housing densification. Uh, and so I'm wondering how you think we should understand just as a factional issue within the Democratic Party, uh, the stances towards evolution of the suburbs and housing policy in the 21st century? It's a really important question. And I think, I think it has to do with who's doing the development. So, so I think one thing is that you can see this kind of, um, you know, and there has been, there has been Democrat, you know, Democrats and Gavin Newsom came in and said this, like, we have to build, you know, what is it like, I can't even remember the exact number, but millions and millions of houses and, and housing in California. And so some people just take whatever housing we can get. And that actually opens up new opportunities for developers um, that, you know, that this is a chance to kind of um, for developers to come to come in. Um, I think that um, and so it's like any housing is just the housing that we need. I think that other other um, Democrats like Bernie Sanders have been more um, have been more cynical about that type of approach. Um, and have thought about the kind of the potential that um, that it will lead to kind of who, who will profit from it. Um, and so to build affordable housing means to take a kind of much more meaningful uh, approach that that really does try to target um, that, that low income people or who are benefiting from those policies. Um, so I kind of wanted to ask you a question about like this resistance moms phenomenon that you talked about. Um, and so it's interesting to kind of think about how there are um, 
I guess, like suburban women or suburbanites, um, particularly affluent suburbanites who have kind of embraced certain things such as Black Lives Matter, but don't necessarily kind of believe in the more, um, uh, the more kind of positions on the left about like the police and other uh, criminal justice systems and the system and those sorts of things. I guess I was wondering kind of what is the danger of the Democratic Party kind of embracing those more moderate um, kind of stances at the expense of other um, kind of demographics that may be, um, yeah, that they may want to kind of compel to vote for them. Yeah, I mean, I think this is a big issue. So one part is the, Dem the there's been a longstanding effort of the, or question of the Democratic Party taking certain constituencies for granted, particularly um, constituencies of color. Um, and I think actually in 2016 saw the consequences of that, that there have been a lot of groups who did, people who just didn't, didn't vote. Um, and so there was a, a thought, you know, certain, I think certain candidates ran the idea that that was something that they were gonna really kind of um, work, work toward. One, one of the issues is about the kind of, so there is actually a question of the, their electoral consequences of taking that approach um, that you could, that in, an, in, another, in another type of election cycle that doesn't have the kinds of particular quirks that, that occurred in 2020, that you would alienate a lot of different kinds of people. So you might win suburban voters, but at the consequences of losing others. I think the other question is about policies and that if there's actually a question of kind of trying to make meaningful reforms that 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 um, speak to kind of some of the demands that um, certain per, certain groups of color um, long-standing criminal justice activists have been asking for that running the risk of just sort of focusing on suburban voter suburban moderate resistance moms might not get you those kinds of those that kind of long term those, those types of changes um, So uh, I wanted to ask a question that starts by uh, winding the clock back all the way to what feels like a lifetime ago, the 2016 campaign, when Donald Trump spent a few weeks during the stretch of the campaign uh, giving almost all of his speeches with some signature stump lines about uh, what was at least presented as an appeal for Black support. Uh, but because a lot of those speeches were given in suburban uh, areas, uh, something I heard from pundits a lot at the time that I think was something of a consensus view is that the point there wasn't actually that he thought he could win a significant margin in the Black community, but instead that he wanted to signal to white moderates in the suburbs that he wasn't a racist, or at least he wasn't too racist, and that they could feel okay about voting for him. Uh, in light of the way you described Joe Biden's remarks during the first debate, it's kind of uh, saying, uh, you know, suburbia isn't going to go for a uh, overt racism anyway, in a way that may have just been trying to make uh, those white Democrats in or white moderates in suburban areas feel better about themselves. Do you think that an important part of white suburban politics is feelings of white guilt, uh, maybe even more strongly self-hate and reckoning with uh, that kind of complex psychological issue? Absolutely. I think there's a huge amount of that and kind of certain kinds of validations. Um, I mean, I think that that's one thing I just showed, like Nixon explicitly said it, like, you're not racist. Like, I'm not racist. You're not racist. If you vote for me, like together, we're not racist. Um, and so I think that that's something that um, that sort of appealing to that particular part of kind of white suburban, this, this kind of white suburban liberal ideology that sort of that I've looked at that supports kind of individual rights and opportunity. Um, it, it's it, that it, I think that that candidates have picked up on that as a particular kind of um, as a particular kind of strategy, and it kind of avoids a real reckoning um, with the kinds of with certain kinds of privilege that that's there. So the next question comes from a parent, um, and they ask: Are women in suburbs properly reflected in polling surveys? Um, I'm not a polling um, expert by any means. Um, and so um, my sense of it is, I mean, this is this question of people actually saying what they, um, what they think um, in a poll. And I always think that you have to be kind of skeptical, um, especially around issues of race. And I think that, um, I mean, that's the, the, the kind of classic, the, the famous um, Bradley effect. But 
Um, but I think that um, they, I think that one of the things that happened in 20, my understanding is that happened in 2016 is that um, there wasn't, with the way that they were doing polling, um, they didn't actually account for certain kinds of education levels. Um, and they, they're now trying to readjust for that. And so that there's a more accurate understanding of, um, of, of, of people, but I'm, I'm someone I use polling data in this talk, but I think it's always good. I always try to teach students to, te to be skeptical um, in, um, in, in what's there. And I think it's also hard. I mean, that, as I said, like the, the media has been focusing a lot on suburban women and sort of finding these stories. And I never know, you know, they're really interesting to read, but I never know how it, are they fully accurate? Are you getting a fully accurate picture by the per what someone's telling the New York Times? Uh, lots of people have kind of pontificated that COVID-19 could be an inflection point for American urbanization and that people might start to fear dense environments more. I'm wondering whether you think that that trend, if it does materialize in the long term, is going to have an impact on suburban politics as maybe some of the people from my generation as we graduate out of uh, college move to suburban areas where we feel like we're not going to uh, get infectious diseases instead of going to the uh, urban superstar cities that we might have otherwise. I think it's a huge issue. And I think the other thing was that there was a big trend of kind of the, so the, the types of kind of affluent knowledge workers that I look at, um, actually a lot of them were, were um, of this generate of the kind of in contemporary times were staying in cities and living in places like Brooklyn um, or certain sort of neighborhoods of DC and um, LA. LA is a little bit different because it, it's already kind of, it doesn't have the same kind of dense, density. Um, but now with, um, with COVID, there's been this like, there, there's been this huge like push amongst kind of people to move out to the suburbs. And so it's like a re a recreation of the kinds of patterns of suburbanization that, that happened in the 19, um, the 1950s and going onwards that people with small ki kids want more space, um, and various different, um, various different things. I think, especially if you're having your whole family in an apartment with everyone on doing like their various different zoom things, it's like you want as much of a big yard as possible. And so it's driving up kind of the interest in sub suburbia. And I think it's going to, it will create all these kinds of patterns. I think it's a huge issue for sort of where people um, are going to, um, to move and how it's going to kind of affect um, some of these kinds of um, the sort of economics of many cities. Thank you so much for joining us tonight, Professor Geismer, and for answering all of our questions. Uh, to close off, I wanted to give you the opportunity just to leave us with any parting thoughts. Well, I feel terrible. I didn't, I lost track of time. I think I was so caught up in reading Trump's tweets that I didn't give enough time for the Q&A. Um, so I will tell you all that um, if you have any questions for me, um, please contact me by email. Um, I would love to continue the conversation that way. I'm always um, open. I know I'm not on, um, none of us are on campus, but, <laughs> but, um, but if, you, um, if you have any questions, I would love to answer them. So, and I thank you all for, um, for taking the time to listen. Um, and finally, um, if you haven't voted yet, go vote on Tuesday. I'm in. On behalf of Claremont McKenna College and the Athenaeum, thank you all for joining us tonight. Special thanks to Professor Geismer and to all of those who sent in their questions. Don't forget to join us for our next virtual ATH event, which will be on Thursday, October 29th at 5 p.m. Pacific. Professor Jack Pitney will join us to preview the 2020 election. See you all then.